الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين امين. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. And it should have been before inviting me, it is a great pleasure to be here. I have to speak about a very uncomfortable topic, unfortunately. And it is a topic which often inflames people's passions. Uh, it can drive people to say things which are not ordinarily said. But of course it is a discussion which is a necessary one because we live amongst people and once we live amongst people there are questions and dynamics of power and of politics. So I've been asked to speak a little bit from a Muslim perspective about the recent elections and the election results. So, at the beginning and at the very outset, let me ask for maaf, let me ask for forgiveness, because I intend to speak, as I said, about a topic which can arise suspicions, which can invoke anger, which can betray passions, and which can promote some kind of polarization and division amongst ourselves. But this is not my intention. We know all too well what happened in the early history of Islam when alongside the growth of the Umayyad Empire, the major political development within Islam in this early period was the sectarian split between Sunni and Shiite Muslims, which gave rise to fundamental and sometimes irreconcilable theological, doctrinal and even practical differences. So in spite of the many similarities that we had, it created a fundamental division and split. <coughs> so my intention is not to revisit that split, but it is to suggest that we have reached a point in our politics in which if we believe the popular media, there has been such monumental change and there has been such difference that we could lead to certain points of division. Now, I don't think we will ever reach a point of division in which theological or doctrinal differences in our belief. But I think we can cast our mind back to the beginning of this election period when two Muslim brothers who belong to two different political parties decided to use a very emotive issue, the question of Palestine, as a campaigning tool. And of course, given that the two brothers from respective different political parties took different positions along with what their parties had suggested. The one took a position which is highly unpopular amongst Muslims. The other obviously took a position which was popular amongst Muslims. But what happened? The one which took an unpopular view branded the other one a kafir and the one who took the other view branded the other person a kafir. Now I'm not sure that our contemporary politics, that our contemporary existence in the world should be inciting such division, firstly, but secondly, that it avoids that kind of labeling. Because it is a serious charge to excommunicate someone from a set of beliefs that they themselves have professed to. So, the first thing I want to suggest is that even though there are changes happening, and even though this election appeared to have said that there is this monumental change, that this kind of debate and discussion amongst ourselves should not be introducing these kinds of words in the political debate that we have. So, with that opening, I want to advance four arguments today. The first is to the question of diversity and difference, but with diversity and difference must come a degree of tolerance. So, 
If we think about our differences, they are acceptable because there are differences about the way in which we live in the world today. But those differences should not, and I reiterate this, invoke the kind of words in which we excommunicate brothers and sisters from the very religion that they decide to profess because we have a difference of opinion on one or other issue. So the question is, now that we've reached, or the media has said that we've reached this monumental aspect of change, what does this mean for us? The first is let's return to the question of whether there was in fact a fundamental change. Have we reached a point of such fundamental change that they might introduce schisms and splits within the community as a whole? But let's face it, historically, Muslims have struggled to have a common position on many issues. This is understandable, given that the divisions are long, the divisions have a durable history of stretching back 200, 300 years, at least in South Africa, with respect to colonialism and apartheid. But we know that we've had divisions, or we had the major, first major division at the time at which the Umayyad dynasty had, had arisen, and that the split between Shiite and Sunni Muslims had occurred. But we are not at that point. But all through the years, we've had some kind of division. We've had divisions in the sense that when they introduced the tricameral system in 1983, admittedly most Muslims avoided it, but there were some who embraced it. Amongst those who avoided it, some of us decided to follow the UDF and the call of Islam, Others decided to, to follow Qibla, and yet others remained neutral, outside of it. So this kind of political division or different political attitudes have never been new. But they have never, up until this point, invoked that ugly word that we always try to avoid. So what happened after apartheid was that it also revealed that there isn't a homogenous Muslim community. We don't all think alike. And we're not meant to all think alike on everything. So significant diversity is something we have always tolerated. And it's something we need to continue to tolerate, particularly given the fact that in this province, most people decided to vote one way. Whereas in other parts of the country, people decided to vote another way. That is okay. But I want to return to this question about whether there has been such fundamental change and that the change is so big and so monumental as the media would have us believe. Now, it is true that if you look closely at this election, actually there are three different stories which emerge. The first is that yes, there is an aspect of change. But there's also a very strong aspect of continuity and a very strong aspect of consolidation. So let me talk about the easier one first. There has been continuity in the sense that, look, while the ANC may have lost at least four of the big metropolitan areas, they still continue to control three of them. So that's one aspect of continuity. The second, is that even in a province like this one, and in this city, the change didn't occur because it was a continuation of what we'd had over the past period. So there wasn't really change. There has been a pattern of continuity. In fact, in this province, it hasn't even just been a question of continuity. It has, in fact, been a question of consolidation because the party that was in control over the last little while continues to be con in control even in bigger numbers. And in fact, in the Western Cape, what that party did was that it consolidated its support even in a little town like Beaufort West. So it wrests control away from what was an ANC coalition to now become a completely DA-controlled province. Now, I would hazard that we should never condemn anyone who has decided to make a set of choices in that way. So the story of continuity and the story of consolidation is present. 
But there is a story of change. The story of change, however, is not as dramatic as has been made out to be because large parts of the country still remain within the control of the ANC. Many of the metropolitan areas, three of them out of seven, remain in control of the ANC. And if you look at the overall picture of the country, actually the ANC dropped 8% nationally, but the opposition combined only picked up 5%. So what happened to the other 3%? The other 3% is the fact that people decided to stay away. That they stay away is ethically, religiously, morally justifiable if they wish to do so. But we as Muslims, given that this change has happened, are faced with the fundamental question. Because a national governing party which loses control and influence over a set of people in metropolitan areas who control large parts of the economy, need a kind of influence to be able to drive growth, to be able to drive employment. And importantly, we don't want growth and employment for its own sake. We want them because they provide dignity. And we as Muslims have to carry ourselves with dignity. But dignity is not only for us. Dignity is for everyone. And our responsibility in this temporal existence to purchase our continuity in the hereafter is to ensure that we provide the kind of dignity for everyone in this temporal world so that we purchase our longevity, inshallah, in the hereafter. And so, if dignity and the provision of dignity is one of our core responsibilities as Muslims, we have got to think about how we change the structure of how we think about political influence and about the way in which we're going to exercise that influence. So when thinking about this, I urge you to think about the nature of the changes which have happened. They may not be as monumental as has been pretended. So ultimately what we have emerging is a combined story of continuity, consolidation and change. Now how we choose to engage with this is a question we all have to ask of our individual conscience. But I will tell you this, that you know, in the suburban areas, and unfortunately I have to talk about a sensitive topic like race, in the suburban areas, people turn out in very large numbers to vote. That is a good thing, because unlike other parts of the continent, it shows that a highly mobile, sophisticated, urbanized, cosmopolitan elite still remains invested in the political system. And it's a good thing to remain invested in the political system because being invested in the political system means that we continue to play an active role in public life, which is something that Muslims have to continue to do. But it does also mean that while there was a big suburban vote to turn out, those suburbanites had a blinkered, homogenous view because they voted in very large numbers for one political party. But it is amongst the poorer sections, in the townships, in marginal communities, where the really interesting things are happening. Because they did not vote en masse in one blinkered way. They thought very carefully about the political choice they make. So not only did some of them decide, like some of us who might be sitting here, decide to stay away, some of them spread their votes across the different parties. But to return to the theme of dignity, if all of these people are showing such differences in political attitudes, how do we relate to them in ways which show up their dignity in the choices that they make? And so when we think about this diversity of change which is happening amongst the poorer people, as opposed to those who are rich, we need to think about how these racial attitudes have begun to polarize the society. So our role is to reconcile those kinds of differences and to try to make them apparent. So our duty as Muslims is to ensure that there's care and dignity for those who are around us, 
Those who have chosen to turn out in high numbers and choose one particular political party are entitled to do so. We are entitled to make different choices if we choose to do so. But our choices always need to fixate on the fact that we have to restore and ensure dignity for all of those who participate. And for those who participate, it is important to note the kind of diversity of changes in political attitudes which have happened. The second is that given our own convictions as Muslims, to be guided by virtue rather than vice, to be guided by the virtues of the Quran and the Sunnah, we need to play a much more meaningful role in charting a path to a politics of principles, to a politics of values, of good values, not merely the politics of interest. Because it is the politics of interest which appear to have animated everyone across the political divide. So today what we are faced with is making a choice between a politics of principle and a politics of interest. And so if we choose the politics of interest, leave that to those of us who have to watch and analyze it. The choice we need to make as personal individuals, as Muslims, first and foremost, is to choose the politics of principle. So any of our jobs, whether from the pulpit or from anywhere else, is not to suggest how people must think, but to suggest how people are thinking in society and for you to make the choice of whether you follow that. And that leaves us with three dilemmas. The first is how we play a more civically active role as a Muslim community, particularly in the economy. And if we take one example from a religious, from a different religious perspective, and we think about the Catholic Bank in Germany, this bank has made investments in the green economy, in renewable resources, and they remained outside of the dilemmas of the global financial crisis. So we need to think about how we remodel our Islamic finance institutions simply in order to drive growth and to provide dignity to those who don't have it. The second is we need to be more civically active and we need to build bridges not just between our own community which is beginning to show a greater amount of diversity but between our communities and the indigenous African communities of which of late there has been significant tensions emergent. So there have been accusations made by our African sisters and brothers that often on massive occasions, on big occasions, they remain invisible. So if we need to build these bridges not just amongst ourselves, we need to find a cross path to build bridges across different communities in the country, whether it be by race or whether it be by class. And the last area in which we face a big challenge is to try and make choices which must suit us as a community. Of late, you will know that the pressure for countries like ours to look at things like anti-terror legislation, to control the way in which we decide to use our resources, governments are coming under increasing pressure to encroach on the private spaces of individuals. So you will remember these two children from nuclear in Johannesburg who were supposedly caught with illicit literature and ammunition, so to speak. That pressure, at a moment of change like this, provides an incentive for those who don't like us to provide pressures on our governments to intrude on our privacy, on our ability to conduct our affairs in the ways in which we choose. So those are the three major challenges we would face given the changes that have happened, not as monumental as has led us believe, but certainly changes we need to take note of and that we need to think about carefully. Shukran, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and ultimately Allah knows best.